Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome on behalf of the Suterbeek program. My name is Lisa Duland. I work at the Suterbeek program. And uh, we've just been watching uh, Bradley Manning Had Secrets, a short film by uh, Adam Butcher. Uh, you couldn't read all of it, but I think you got the, the gist. It was not only about Bradley Manning uh, leaking our, yeah, US secrets uh, to WikiLeaks, but it was also about Bradley Manning uh, being confused about his gender identity. Um, but it is, it is also a story about resistance, and that's why we've started this evening with this uh, short film. The state uh, has always had secrets, and they are still allowed to have them. Uh, we citizens, on the other hand, do not, or less uh, today. Whereas metadata collection by the NSA and the like is still going on, uh, we are not to dig into the state's secrets. Uh, and the question is, how do we retain a capacity to resist uh, when our every, every move can be traced uh, at the moment or retraced uh, later on? Um, we are honored uh, to have here tonight British philosopher Howard Kegel. Um, he is professor of modern uh, European philosophy at the Kingston University, London, and he is here on invitation of the uh, OZSW, uh, the Dutch Research School of Philosophy, uh, of which uh, uh, he is the keynote speaker. It starts tomorrow, and we're honored that he's here today for a public lecture. And um, he will be uh, talking about resistance, the need for resistance and protest in the 21st uh, century. In 2003, he, uh, uh, 13, I'm sorry, he wrote on resistance, a philosophy uh, of defiance. And tonight he will get uh, into the concept of resistance, into its history, uh, its birthplace, its roots, and will then turn to the branches, to the future of this concept, uh, and to the present, of course, where we can see resistance in the Occupy movement, in the Arab Spring, and of course, most recently, uh, in the Hong Kong resistances. And he will talk about what that capacity to resist, as he calls it, uh, might be, and why it is important that we uh, hold on to it. Um, after his lecture, he will enter into a discussion with uh, Bart Verheijen. He is uh, doing his PhD research uh, on resistance literature of the Napoleonic age uh, at this university. And the discussion will be chaired by Evert van der Zwierde. He is professor of political philosophy at this university as well. Um, but that's after the lecture. So first, your warm welcome uh, to Howard Kegel. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Lisa, for the invitation to speak this evening. Thank you for, all for coming. Thank you to Bart and Evert for being implicated with me uh, later on um, <laughs> after the, uh, the talk. Uh, the, yeah, my title is The Need for Resistance and Protest in the 21st Century. Uh, the revolutions of 1989, 25 years ago, announced for me the end of the epoch of revolution that opened in France in 1789 and shaped world history for two centuries. Those revolutions marked a moment of radical change, and with them, the classic revolutionary configuration of mass mobilization in the name of class, nation, even race, by vanguard parties pursuing revolutionary projects, I think became a thing of the past. Yet the shape of the politics destined to succeed this departed revolution, is still by no means self-evident. You know, what kind of politics do we have now that there is no longer this you know, revolutionary uh, kind of paradigm for political opposition? But I think what is becoming kind of very clear from the first uh, decade and a half of the 21st century is that the end of the epoch of revolution was not, as some hoped, some conservative commentators hoped, the end of history. But it was, in fact, more the intensification of the history of political opposition in the direction of a politics of resistance. The Arab Spring, 
the Indignados and the Occupy movements, the Taksim Republic in Istanbul, and most recently the contestation in Hong Kong, cannot be described or should not be understood as insurrectionary movements dedicated to the seizure of power and the implementation of major revolutionary change, but prudent and courageous acts of resistance. If we try to understand them according to the revolutionary paradigm, we can only be disappointed. We can only say they did not achieve the revolutionary transformation that we expected from them. The problem, I think, there would be in our expectation, not in the actions uh, themselves. That these acts of resistance, they were not revolutionary uh, acts. And if then we want to understand them and appreciate the promises and the dangers that this contemporary resistance uh, represents for the coming century, I think we need to think a little more about resistance itself and the limits of protest. We need to try and understand this very um, elusive concept, in many ways, of resistance. Now, I tried to show in my book on resistance that Lisa mentioned that resistance, a theory of resistance and a practice of resistance, has always occupied the margin of the revolutionary epoch. So the epoch of revolution that, that begins with the French Revolution was accompanied, but in the margins, by resistance. It was adapted, resistance was adapted by revolutionary projects with varying degrees of success, but also, I think in many respects, pursued its own history over the past two centuries. What we now understand as resistance emerged from attempts to contain or defeat the Napoleonic revolutionary armies that issued, for better or worse, from the French Revolution of 1789. Tactics associated with resistance, such as guerrilla warfare, clandestine struggle, passive disobedience, and the use of terror and spectacular violence, all emerged in the Peninsula War with the Spanish resistance to the Napoleonic armies. Goya's engravings of the disasters of war are a powerful visual testimony to the emergence of this new war of resistance as indeed is the work of Karl von Clausewitz on the other side of Europe, in, uh, in Berlin, which was dedicated to theorizing the tactics and strategies of Widerstand. Although justly famed, Clausewitz's work remains, I think, philosophically underestimated, also politically underestimated for political opposition. His philosoph philosophical sophistication as a post-Kantian thinker was eclipsed by the success of his posthumous on war as a treatise on strategy. You know, it's, it's an error to think that Clausewitz's on war is about war, right? basically about the war of resistance. However, the significance of Clausewitz exceeds his not notoriety as a theorist of war, and I think it's a safe prediction that he and his work will become increasingly important for understanding and pursuing the politics of resistance in the coming century. And there are a number of reasons for making this prediction. The first of them is that Clausewitz's on war is not just dedicated to understanding war, but to theorizing resistance. And this is an achievement that certain of Clausewitz's readers were always very aware of. I mean, the earliest readers that I, that I found that understood this about Clausewitz were Marx and Engels, who were kind of close and very enthusiastic readers of, uh, of Clausewitz. Their kind of reading and their understanding of Clausewitz as a, as a thinker of resistance was subsequently taken up by Lenin, um, the radical change in Lenin's thought in 1916, usually thought to be connected to his kind of reading in Switzerland of Hegel's logic uh, and uh, Aristotle's metaphysics, was also due to his very, very close reading and commentary on Clausewitz. Um, the, the Soviet editors of, uh, of Lenin's collected works were a little nervous about the, comments, the commentaries on uh, Clausewitz and excluded it from the, uh, the collected works. Um, so if you look at the Lenin's philosophical writings from 1916, you'll find the commentary on Aristotle and the commentary on, uh, on Hegel, but nothing on Clausewitz, which is a pity because the, those, uh, those comments kind of are, are among some of the most perceptive kind of readings of Clausewitz as a theorist of uh, resistance. But this understanding of, of Clausewitz as a resistant um, emerged 
mainly in the 1960s. And with writers such as Ramon Aron, who began to read Clausewitz in the light of the anti-Nazi resistance of the Second World War. And this reading of Clausewitz seemed to have little in common with his prominent role, this is almost the other Clausewitz, um, as an inspiration for the strategic doctrine of the Cold War, as theorized by Kahn in his book on thermonuclear war in the late 1950s. So there's almost like two Clausewitzes emerging in the 50s and 60s. There's a Clausewitz of uh, the Cold War, of nuclear strategy, of deterrence, um, and the um, attempt to um, avoid escalation of uh, violent nuclear warfare. And there's the Clausewitz of, uh, of resistance. And we'll see that they cross over sometimes in, in interesting ways. So the second reason, I think, for the growing significance of Clausewitz is connected with his post-Kantian philosophical persona. And Clausewitz followed an interpretation of Kant developed by his teacher, Friedrich Kieserwetter, that offered, we might say, a minority report on the critical philosophy. And this was one interested, I hope I don't, I hope I don't lose you, but it was one interested in the modal category of actuality rather than the category of possibility and its correlate freedom that was to be proved so central to the philosophical development of Fichte, Hegel, and their, uh, their legacy. So what, what Clausewitz takes from his teacher, and which you know, his teacher, Kieserwetter, he's was Kant's closest disciple. He wrote the first book on Kant that was approved by Kant as a statement of his philosophy. Uh, he's not at all interested in freedom. He doesn't think that Kant is a philosopher of, uh, of, of freedom. And Clausewitz adopts this. And this, this perspective allowed Clausewitz at the beginning of the 19th century, to focus not so much on acts of resistance as on what he called the capacity to resist. And this is quite important, because I think when we try to understand kind of resistance today, we might be tempted to look at these events you know, of resistance, the Arab Spring, Occupy, uh, Hong Kong, you know, Istanbul, we might want to say, well, these are acts of resistance, but somehow you know, they are, they're coming from nowhere and they're going nowhere. You know, this has been one of the great reproaches about the Occupy movement. You know, it came from nowhere, it went nowhere. Now, what Clausewitz says is that it's an error to look at the acts of resistance and not to understand that, in fact, these acts of resistance form part of a, of a developing capacity to resist. A Widerstandsfähigkeit. An ability, capacity to resist. Now, this attention to the capacity to resist, I think, offers an important lesson for thinking about how resistance in the 21st century can be understood and can be pursued. It tells us that our acts of resistance have to be guided, above all, by the objective of either compromising our adversary's capacity to resist or this is perhaps more important for, uh, for Clausewitz and maybe for, for resistance today, enhancing our own Widerstandsfähigkeit. So that when we engage in an act of resistance, we, we can't think about the immediate aim of resistance. You know, we, we can't just think about we want to you know, achieve a modification in um, uh, the selection of candidates for uh, an, an election. But we also have to think how can the capacity of resi to resist that we have produced, how can that then be preserved or enhanced in the future? Even if that means withdrawing from immediate contestation around a particular aim. So what's important here then, I think, and, and it's helpful, is, is the capacity to resist. Now linked to this strategic principle are two two further important, if I think very uncomfortable implications. Uncomfortable for um, the minority of you know, people, the minority of humanity that's able to live in kind of peace and luxury uh, today. So these un uncomfortable implications are the first that in politics, as in war, and from the standpoint of resistance, these are convertible arts. The art of politics is also the art of war. Um, I'm thinking of war as politics by other means. Clausewitz says war as politics by other means, becoming Foucault's politics as war by other means. That 
in our political life and in our political action, we have enemies. And I think for probably most of us here, certainly for myself, I would hate to think that my actions are, 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 you know, are dictated you know, overwhelmingly by my hatred for an enemy. Probably most of us have the luxury of not having an enemy. But I think that's a minority kind of position you know, in, in humanity. You know, that in fact, most, you know, most, most people alive now have enemies you know, that are dedicated to compromising their capacity to resist. Um, it may be that we're not so clear about our enemies than we think we are. Maybe we do have enemies, um, but don't like to, uh, don't like to, you know, to think about that too, uh, too seriously. Clausewitz says, and maybe this is just part of the time, the early, the early uh, 19th century, Clausewitz says, you know, you have to act you know, with the full understanding that you have an enemy, and that enemy is you know, destined to your destruction. Now, if we think, you know, if we try to think politics in that way, we can see we're, we're, we're in a different kind of political game to you know, the politics that most of us have been uh, um, kind of brought up to, uh, you know, to, to participate in. And it's very, I think it's very uncomfortable and uneasy, this kind of politics. I suspect, indeed, that it's hard for most European populations to you know, appreciate this, to appreciate having an enemy, you know, even after you know, the grim history of the 20th century. Resistance, resistant politics, and I think this is you know, a feature of the politics of resistance, it is conducted against an implacable and feared enemy. If you resist, you have an enemy. I don't think kind of resistance can take place without an enemy. It's something else. Resistance always has uh, an enemy. The resistance to national socialism, I think, is the clearest example you know, for contemporary uh, Europeans. But the sense of enmity is not optional for resistant politics. And I think this is, this is a difficult feature. It may be the reason why many of us, in the end, would not want to you know, endorse a resistant politics. The enemy, though, can be, must be respected. And I think this is the case in the Zapatista movement in Chiapas, Mexico, and with the Green and Common women in the UK during the 1980s. These resistants were under no illusions about their enemy, nor about their enemy's perception of them. I think the Green and Common women are an interesting case, because in their writings, they have a very clear and implacable sense that they have an enemy. You know, the enemy is you know, the, the nuclear military machine. Um, and they, wanted, they did not encourage any compromise with the police, however friendly the police were. You know? But this also co coincided with extreme pacifist, nonviolent uh, politics. So enmity doesn't necessarily entail violence or kind of violent uh, resistance. Similarly with, uh, with the Zapatistas, who have a very controlled um, use of violence. So that's the first uncomfortable implication, I think, of, you know, of a resistant, resistant politics. The second, I think, is the second uncomfortable implication, is that the proper model guiding political action is no longer logic, nor the pursuit of rational consensus achieved through debate or dialogue, but its strategy. Or the, tactic, or the tactical marshalling of resources for creating and maintaining a capacity to resist over the long term. And again, that's something that most of us in this room would probably find quite, quite hard to endorse. You know, that in fact, you know, my political action is not going to be, you know, I'm going to try and convince my conservative adversary or my radical adversary of the error of their ways, or we're going to try and find a compromise uh, with which we can all live. But I'm going to behave strategically with respect to my enemy. Very, very kind of different vision of, uh, of, of politics. Now, those are the two uncomfortable implications. But now I th you know, you know, I've been stressing that maybe we're not in that predicament. But now I want to suggest that maybe we are. You know, maybe we do have enemies. Now, one of the most striking features of the modern state, you know, for me at least, is its willingness to employ strategy with respect to its populations, its willingness to consider its own citizens as its enemy, while pretending outrage when its citizens themselves employ strategy against it. 
I think in the Ernst Fall, you know, in, in, the, in the last case, the state will always regard its citizens as enemies against whom it is, to prepare, it is prepared to deploy strategically guided violence. So this very, struck me very clearly in the UK during the student protests in the UK. And many students kind of had a, a process of political education because they couldn't quite believe that they were being treated as an enemy by the state and the police, that their protest kind of quickly was regarded as acts of an internal enemy and it was treated, and was, you know, was a policed ex with extreme violence. However, the state is outraged if its citizens respond in a like manner. There is, for example, and this is, this is a, an example of this, a striking contrast between the US government's strategic tolerance of the NSA's enthusiastic collection of metadata and even details of the communications of its own citizens and those of its allies, including, uh, including us, and it's pretended that, on the one hand, there's a strategic tolerance, and on the other hand, there's this pretended moral outrage at the equally strategically motivated work of WikiLeaks and whistleblowers such as Manning, who we heard of earlier, and Snowden in revealing state secrets. So why is it morally reprehensible for whistleblowers to reveal state secrets, but kind of acceptable for the NSA to overstep the limits of legality? in collecting uh, information. There's kind of structural hypocrisy uh, in, in, the, in, in the state's kind of position. It's considered prudent and proper for the state to have secrets, while morally questionable, even criminal, for members of civil society to behave in the same secretive way. So if I start using sophisticated encryption on my uh, kind of mobile telephone, the state will immediately consider that to be evidence of my criminal intent. You know, the sheer fact that I want to encrypt my communications. Um, the fact that the state can overhear all of my conversations through the back door in all our mobile telephones. If, if any of you have sort of the mobile telephone on now, you are transmitting you know, this talk to the NSA, you're, you're shopping me. Uh, if you have the phone switched off in your pocket but the battery's still in it, you're transmitting uh, this potentially to the, uh, the NSA. Um, you know, the, our mobile phones are, are, are wide open to, uh, to interception. But if I try to introduce encryption into my telephone, it's almost prima facie proof of my, my, my ill intent, my evil intent. Yeah. So it's, it's prudent for the state to have secrets. It's criminal for a citizen to, uh, to have secrets. In the UK, conspiracy law has, cons has historically been used to repress the possibility of opposition or strategic debate. So, to trespass, and this is in the UK, I don't know the situation in the Netherlands, it would be interesting to learn. In the UK, to trespass or occupy a space is a civil law offence. It's not a criminal offence to occupy in the, uh, the UK. To discuss doing so with another person, or with others, becomes the very serious criminal offence of conspiracy, you know, with large, you know, powerful jail sentences, um, and you know, the entire uh, kind of weight of the criminal law against it. So if spontaneously several of us occupy uh, you know, a public building in, um, in central London, this will be you know, a civil law offence, it will go to a civil court, and the owner of the building will have to ask us to leave or you know, get a court order for us to leave. If the police can show that I've talked to somebody else about doing this, if they can have my telephone records, that I made a phone call with someone else that was there and we discussed doing this, then we are liable to the very, very serious criminal offence of, uh, of conspiracy. So the state claims not only a monopoly of violence, this is the sociologist Max Weber repeatedly taught us this, but now a monopoly of strategy and also a monopoly of secrecy. You know, so the, new, you know, the monopoly of violence of the new state is also a monopoly of secrecy. The state can have secrets, but it doesn't you know, like its citizens to have secrets. Members of civil society are not supposed to act strategically, but they're, they're expected to behave logically according to their interests 
or morally according to their ethical positions. Yet with the emergence of a politics of resistance and strategically motivated protest, civil society in the 21st century is, whether it likes it or not, positioning itself to challenge the state's monopoly of strategy and secrecy. Now, the information or intelligence necessary for strategic discussion and action is now more easily available to civil society than it's ever been, although this availability is severely contested. While at the same time, the possibility for conf confidential, i.e. secret, strategic discussion and the circulation of the precise spatio-temporal coordinates for resistant action has been extended, once again, in the face of opposition, on the part of the state, has been extended by civil society. And what has made and is making this possible is, of course, the web and its associated internet and social media, and the possibility that they have opened for oppositional strategic debate and action, and with it the constitution of a linked global and local capacity to resist. Interestingly, this linkage was practiced in the name of the web prior to the existence of the internet by the Green and Common Women, and later perfected using the internet by the Zapatistas um, and the complex figure of uh, Subcomandante Marcos, who, as you may know, changed his name uh, this year. Subcomandante Marcos is no more. The web has become crucial, then, for the strategic mobilization of civil society, and with it, the constitution of a 21st century capacity to resist. The central role paid by the web in organizing the recent challenges to the state, and this began uh, historically with the Russian resistance to the coup d'etat, um, and has continued from the Arab Spring up to the recent Hong Kong uh, events, this testifies to the opportunities opened by the web for the mobilization of civil society in resisting um, the state, but also, I think, and this mustn't be underestimated, to its risks. Now, the history of the web is indeed full of un unanticipated consequences. It never fails to entertain me that the web originated in the neo klaswitzian doctrine of the Cold War, kind of mentioned earlier. Klaswitzian themes of escalation and deterrence were shared by both adversaries, you know, the US and the USSR in that conflict, and specifically in the United States' attempt to en enhance its Widerstandsfähigkeit by ensuring that its strategic command structure remained intact in the event of its territory and command centers suffering a nuclear first strike. Now, this is the thinking that led to the development of the, uh, the web. The development of the web then was part of this Klauswitzian, conservative Klauswitzian military agenda. But its decentralization of nodes of information storage and relays and its technique of reiterated dispatch of packets of information by different routes until acknowledgement of receipt and the reconstitution of the message quickly developed in unanticipated libertarian directions. Originally, this was about kind of maintaining a communications capacity in the event of a nuclear first strike. Um, these, however, you know, the, the libertarian directions that it took, the unanticipated directions that it took, should not be overestimated nor their strategic vulnerability overlooked in the enthusiasm for what might seem to be a new form of political mobilization. I think many errors have been made over the last 10 years by an over-reliance or uh, an overestimation of the, the power of the web and an underestimation, even ignorance, of its vulnerability. I think it wouldn't be an exaggeration to regard the web as one of the main contemporary theaters for the struggle of contemporary resistance movements to maintain and enhance a capacity to resist. And the struggle is conducted on two main fronts. The first is resistance to the state's claim to a monopoly of information and strategy. And the second is resistance to the state infiltration and surveillance of social networks and the capacity to resist that they have helped bring into existence. The first front is the struggle for and against secrecy. The attempt to sustain powerful encryption on the web against the will of the state. And also, and associated with this, the effort to compromise state and corporate encryption. This struggle has a history dating back to the 1990s 
in which WikiLeaks, the Snowden NSA exposures, and Anonymous are but the most recent skirmishes. At stake is the state's claim to monopolize the information transmitted on the web and to archive it at its openly illegal pleasure. Ironically, the extension of access to secret material that made Manning and Snowden's whistleblowing possible was part of a US military and intelligence strategic response to 9-11 and the perceived compromises to the USA's capacity to resist that was traced to discrete intelligence agencies' reluctance to share information. This decentralization of the arcana of state, necessary to secure the capacity to resist, in this case also paradoxically undermined it and made it vulnerable to exposure and leaking. The other side of the coin to this exposure of the arcana of state, the secrets of the state, the secret life of the state, is maintaining oppositional secrecy through encryption. Now, how many people here use encryption for their telephone calls? Yeah, yeah. But, um, there's, only one, there's only one wise person in the room. <laughs> this is a, a difficult and fallible project, but one which is pursued with great strategic clarity and a keen sense of the paradox involved in protecting civil societies authentically, kind, protecting the public realm of civil society through secrecy. You know, so debates that take place by means of encryption, um, you know, that is free from the surveillance of the state, are really the most open kind of discussions possible you know, within um, you know, current civil society. And yet they're only possible because of encryption, because they're secret. This is an old problem. It goes back to the publication of Kant's essay. I realize I, I'm, I'm quite enthusiastic about Kant. But it goes back to the publication of Kant's essay, answering the question, what is enlightenment? Some of you may have uh, come across. In the pages of the Journal of a Secret Society, of the Berlinische Monatschrift. So here's a text that's proclaiming you know, the, um, uh, the virtues of openness, of Fendlichkeit, open discussion. Argue as much as you like, as long as you obey but it's published in a journal of a secret society. Kant, I think, got his maxim wrong. I mean, I think today it should be argue as much as you like, but disobey. The ability, then, to compromise the state's capacity to resist by weakening its monopoly of secrecy, and hence being able to develop a strategic capacity, is an important complement to the ability to use social media in constituting an oppositional capacity to resist, organizing an oppositional capacity to resist on the part of civil society. Now, these two campaigns are normally, are usually considered separately. You know, so the work of Anonymous and uh, kind of WikiLeaks doesn't seem to be, isn't often considered to be the same sort of thing or part of the same struggle as the use of social media to coordinate um, kind of actions. But compromising the state's ability to survey civil society's use of the internet is essential for the latter's ability to resist the state through public actions, such as occupations and um, other forms of resistance. For this is one of the simultaneous strengths and weaknesses of using the social media to foster strategic discussion and to organize resistance. And Julian Assange put, put it very elegantly in a thought-provoking collection of dialogues that published uh, uh, two years ago called Cypherpunks, Freedom and the Future of the Internet. Speaking of the Mubarak government's hunting down of the participants in the 2008 Facebook protest, he noted that in 2011, three years later, the Egyptian protesters took pains to avoid using Twitter or Facebook. He says, he comments on this, so if it's going to be successful, that's the resistance, if it's going to be successful, there needs to be a critical mass. You need to get a lot of people uh, into the square from the streets. It needs to happen fast, and now this is the, almost the Clausewitzian side of Assange, and this is you know, something that is quite disturbing. It needs to happen fast, and it needs to win. So if you engage in a struggle using the social media, you cannot lose, you must win. Because, Assange continues, if the resistance doesn't win, then that same infrastructure that allows a fast consensus to develop will be used to track down and marginalize all the people who were involved in seeding 
the consensus. So if you use this, uh, if you use these um, social media kind of carelessly, you, you will be tracked down. I mean, this is happening on the Chinese mainland um, at this moment. Now this, en this entails then that the stakes of resistance, you know, what is at stake with resistance, are, are being raised by using social media. Certainly they can, they can deliver unprecedented levels of articulated and disciplined mass action, but also every step in constituting this capacity to resist and mounting resistance, as in the Istanbul Taksim Republic, for example, every step can be traced and policed if the resistance is not successful. The very arts that permitted the creation of a capacity to resist on the eve of resistance can also undo it the morning after. Megadata can be used to trace associations. And this is routine work for the NSA and other intelligence agencies. It's precisely codified. Um, by using megadata, we, you can work out patterns of association. And these patterns of association are also used for elimination in certain cases. Um, and to constitute with extreme precision, the, to reconstitute with extreme precision the shape of the capacity to resist and to identify its key members. So these acts of resistance using the social media can work very quickly, but if they fail or if they, if, if they don't succeed, um, then you know, they can be decapitated you know, very quickly, almost using the same, uh, um, same means. Militants and theoreticians, you can be identified by patterns of association. So the web can liberate resistance, it can create a new capacity to resist, but it can also serve as the instrument for its decisive and complete repression. I'm not going to finish there, though. Rosa Luxemburg's uh, dictum that resistant struggle itself gives rise to new capacities and constituencies of opposition, I think was vindicated by the recent action in Hong Kong. Haunted by the memory of the failure of Tiananmen Square, the Tiananmen Square occupation, in 1989, which I think we could say compromised the Chinese capacity to resist for over a quarter of a century, Demonstrators associated with the two main strands of the Hong Kong resistance, Occupy Central with Peace and Love and the Student Scholarism Movement, adopted a strategy that it hoped would ensure the survival of the capacity to resist in the prospect of what Mao himself described in the 1930s as a protracted war of resistance. So I'm citing Mao ironically against, uh, against Mao. But. So, you know, the Chinese resistance were thinking about how can we ensure that this capacity to resist that we've created survives you know, tomorrow. Alongside the restraint and commitment to nonviolence shown by the resistance in Hong Kong, one learned from Gandhi and the US civil rights movement, were a number of other striking tactical innovations. And I think the most important, and, and the one to note you know, for the resistance in the room, was the conscious effort to limit the use of the social media for strategic and to tactical discussion in order precisely not to leave a record of the constitution of the capacity to resist that would help the authorities to unravel and compromise it at a later date. So this was the, le this was the lesson of, uh, of Egypt in uh, uh, 2011. But Hong Kong, I think, went, uh, went a step further because if you, if you refrain from using the social media, if you re refrain from using this instrument for mobilization, which is there, well, maybe the resistance won't even start, or it won't be able to be continued in forceful uh, directions. And what happened in Hong Kong is that the demonstrators made wide use of the, uh, the application FireChat that makes possible an off-grid social network that uses Bluetooth and white Wi-Fi, ideal for mass gatherings. I think most of us use Bluetooth for unloading our kind of pictures from our phone onto a computer or something. I mean, here it was, you know, with, with, uh, with FireChat, it was able to use it for a very kind of radical constitution of the capacity to resist that leaves no traces. Over 100,000 apps were downloaded in a day uh, in Hong Kong during the struggle. But you notice that the, uh, we know how many apps were downloaded. You know, so we know kind of where they were downloaded. You know, so uh, you know, it's not entirely um, kind of good news. Um, and in Hong Kong, the app was put to a use that doesn't seem to have been anticipated by its designers. 
I mean, these designers say on their, their website, you can download this for free. It could be useful to have. Perhaps they say with phone naivete, this is the reason why you should have uh, you know, fire chat according to the designers. Whether you are on the beach or in the subway, at a big game or trade show, camping in the wild, kind of camping in central Hong Kong, or even traveling abroad, simply fire up the app with a friend or two and find out who else is there. Now, the strategic benefit you know, for resistance, I think, is, is nevertheless clear. One of the devices, and this is, this is what occurred, one of the devices connected to FireChat can serve as a portal to the wider web and be exposed you know, on grid. It can be exposed to uh, the internet more generally. But this device can employ deep encryption. So the, the portal devices you know, that are going to take information out of the, the local network constituted by um, FireChat can be encrypted, and the information can go out, and information can uh, come in. But the traffic within, discussion within um, the uh, um, within the local network will not be uh, so revealed. Decrypted messages can be disseminated through FireChat in a way that leave no traces for the state to follow later. Similarly, messages from within FireChat can go to these, these portals and then be disseminated on the World Wide Web um, without leaving traces. This was an example of strategic prudence, characteristic of both previous and contemporary resistant politics. <laughs> It was joined by the other two resistant virtues, an unnegotiable passion for justice and courage. It testified not only to the need for resistance and protest, but also to the means by which it can be pursued. Above all, to what Clausewitz identified as the prime objective of a resistant politics, the creation and preservation not just of an act of resistance and its immediate aims, but more importantly, of the capacity to resist. But I think I should end with some comments on the desirability of a resistant politics. Do we really want a resistant politics? It brings with it a number of problems which might make us wary of adopting it too enthusiastically as a political philosophy or technique. First of all, the emphasis on strategy and enmity might be perceived to bring resistant politics too close to the model of warfare. Perhaps politics and political reason are and should be distinct from strategy. Maybe you want to keep politics discursive will formation, separate from strategic uh, discussion. Secondly, perhaps a resistant politics, however ingenious and imaginative its tactical innovations, perhaps it's ultimately reactive, that it's reacting against initiatives of adversaries, as was perhaps the case in Hong Kong, and not initiating and guiding political change. That is, it's not revolutionary. And thirdly, perhaps resistance is too somber of politics. Its emphasis on the cardinal virtues of courage, prudence, justice, limits the emancipatory elan that, that is characteristic of revolutionary politics to questions of survival under conditions of repression and suffering. And finally, perhaps resistance is less a political philosophy than a political military technique, one that can be adopted in the name of emancipation, but it can also be adopted in the name of reaction and repression. I think these are just some of the difficult questions and decisions that face us if we believe, and if I've been able to convince you, that we are entering into an epoch of resistance. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much, Howard Cagle, for your um, inspiring lecture. Um, which raises a lot of issues, I think, both when it comes to current affairs and also when it comes to the theory of polit politics, political philosophy, mm. your conception of, uh, of resistance as a theoretical conception. Um, we have a second guest um, tonight, which is uh, Bart Verheyen, who wrote a book in Dutch um, on the historiography of the French Revolution to, um, uh, during the two centuries after mm. the French Revolution itself. It's called Geschiedenis onder de guillotine, Twee eeuwen geschiedschrijving van de Franse revolutie. Hier in Nijmegen uitgegeven bij, uh, bij Van Tilt en zeer lezenswaardig. Um, and I'd like to give him the floor for first, um, for first reaction to your talk. Given the fact that both your theory of resistance and his um, history of the history of um, the French Revolution 
uh, start with the same event and the same date, and which seems to be a turning mm. point in European mm. history. So, Bart, yeah. please give your general comments or more specific comments, whatever you like. Thank you very much. Yes, maybe we should debate whether the French Revolution is indeed the starting point of modernity or the starting yeah, point yeah, in European yeah. Revolution. But um, I, I was reading your book, which is very well written and, and, and very interesting points. And I also think that this, this concept of resistance should will be very important for us during the 21st century. Mm. But mm. I also think it has been very important during the French Revolution. Um, mm. And uh, the question I want to raise is what happens when resistance and revolt turns into the revolution and that becomes the status quo mm. of the state? Yeah, yeah. So what happens when the resistance becomes the status quo? Um, because in your book you speak about the resistance as a purification of a society, maybe the old society in revolutions, I mean, in all societies, the old institutes should be broken down in order to transform these institutes into new and better ones. Mm. And this can be done by the means of a revolution. And as you are probably mm. aware, the famous revolutionaries of the French Revolution, like Danton, uh, Robespierre, Marat, Saint Just, yeah. they also wanted to change uh, French society through the French Revolution. And they also mm. had like this idea of how the future should look like. And then in I want to quote Robespierre, because it's always maybe good to quote <laughs> Robespierre. was in a yeah. famous <laughs> speech on <laughs> the 5th of February, 1794. Um, he defended the use of terror and the guillotine and the revolution as status quo. Mm. And he said, uh, we must smother the internal and external enemies of the Republic or perish with them. Mm. Now, in this situation, the first objective of our uh, policy ought to be to lead the people by reason and the people's enemies by terror. The mainspring of popular government in peacetime is virtue. The revolution is at the same time both virtue and terror. Virtue without a terror is fatal, and terror without virtue is impotent. Terror is nothing but prompt severe justice. Um, and so on and so on. And it's that the terror is, <laughs> is, is, is a special principle and it's a general principle of democracy mm. applied to our country, most pressing need. So we really want to defend the terror yeah. as a way of maintaining the status quo of resistance and revolution. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are other famous uh, quotes by revolutionaries who say, no, the revolution cannot be ended because it's a storm where we end and we need to, mm. to, to, to wait until it's over. Um, so again, my first question to you would be, the revolution is a situation of exception, but what happens if the situation of exception becomes the status yeah. quo of society? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's a very... Uh, very, very cogent question, but thanks. I mean, and um, it sort of goes back to the, 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 the role of resistance and, and revolution together. Um, and, and I think, as you say, it, it also goes back to the interpretation of the, uh, the French Revolution and the you know, work of what, what went right and what went wrong during the revolution. Because I think we could look at the very, you know, the, the very early moves mm -hmm. of the French Revolution as being, you know, as being resistance. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, that... Uh, you know, that, yeah, that, that, that there were certain specific injustices which were kind of resisted. Um, and that then began to gather a momentum or to escalate, which eventually, uh, I don't know where you would put this point, but eventually became a kind of mandate for the complete transformation of, uh, of French society. And then subsequently, and, we, and we're talking with, with less than five years mm -hmm. you know, action, subsequently that then became a... You know, uh, uh, you know the, this project of having to defend, you know, the uh, the achievements, you know, through, you know, uh, terror, kind of as 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 you say, but it seems as if there's a certain point where resistance kind of drops away, mm -hmm. you know. So it's almost like a you know, rocket taking off, you know, kind of resistance gets it into movement and then it falls away, and and the revolution then escalates, you know, in in in, in its own into its own kind of logic, um, and kind of. What I, you know, what, you know, what, I, what I might reply to you, or you know, in the form of a question, is saying, could that be an error? You know, could that be a historic error uh, in the French Revolution? You know, not to, you know, to hold to the level of resistance. You know, that is you know, to push this onto you know, the, the revolution, a revolution that is defending virtue with terror, um, that eventually will become empire mm -hmm. um, and completely betray itself uh, in doing so. I mean, isn't there a sense that that moment of resistance is, uh, you know, is, is, is more to be cherished than the revolution that came after? 
I'm aware, of, as I say this, that you know, a philosopher who argued this very persuasively was Nietzsche, you know, who, you know, who approved of the, the early months of the revolution, but then kind of stepped back you know, when, it, when it became a revolution. Yes, but the, the, the famous revolutionary as well, also defending the terror with the resistance ID in, their, in the back yeah, of their heads. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. For them, it was still the exception, situation of exception. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they were still kind of resisting uh, an enemy. I mean, it, it's yes, striking that they saw enemies everywhere, and that's yeah, that's, that's yeah. the resisting part. I think in the revolution, yeah, and that yeah, yeah. that created its own logic. Yeah. So yeah. I'm 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 thinking about this. Is, is this resistance? Is it easily turned into a revolution, which is yeah. like, uh, no, it's like spreading around like a madman, but yeah, yeah. with still keeping an eye on this original yeah, yeah. definition of resistance, yeah. or should we? I think. I think I think you're you're, you're pushing me uh, towards a uh, you know, another an, another point I have to think about, which is the relationship between resistance and terror. Mm -hmm. You know, because um, you know, the, the way you've just described it, but basically, you know, terror is the means of resistance. It certainly became that in the uh, the Spanish resistance to Napoleon, yes. you know, and the the, the, Napole the Napoleonic resistance to the Spanish. You know, I mean, this resistance is always reciprocal, in uh, in, in some way. Mm -hmm. So terror, you know. Uh, is an instrument of, uh, of, of, of resistance. But I mean, for me, that, that un underlies that um, the, you know, the, you know, the dangers or the, the, you know, the care with which we have to you know, think about resistance and mm -hmm. you know, conduct resistance, you know, that, that it is volatile and can quickly become something that we might not kind of wish, it, uh, wish it to be. If I may jump in, yeah. does this have implications for theory of resistance? When you're talking about yeah. the creation of a logic of its own. Yeah, um, yeah. Is it part of your conception that we should have a theory of resistance in order yeah. to maintain resistance as a form of politics yeah. rather than as something which rev with revolutionary zeal yeah, yeah. Um, swipes away society? Yeah, I think it's something that we need to think about and, and, and that, that, needs to, that needs to be theorized. And kind of classically, it, it always seems to have kind of theorized itself or, or theorists of resistance I've always done so in terms of the cardinal virtues. It's mm -hmm. something that I find so interesting. You, you, you find um, uh, kind of justice, prudence, and, um, and courage uh, kind of appearing time and time again. Um, you know, in, in, in Gandhi, kind of throughout um, the, kind of the, you know, the, the theory and practice of resistance. And I think at that point, I think you know, particularly with prudence, you know, we, we could say that is where you know, we can have a, a you know, a theoretical strategic kind of discussion, mm -hmm. you know, so that uh, you know, not to allow um, resistance to move towards a logic of terror, not to allow for escalation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in that sense, mm -hmm. can be an act of prudence. And I think yeah. the, you know, the, the way I, I think Karshwitz worked that through, um, and the way that I, I was trying to describe it now, is by making the capacity to resist, um, or the survival of the capacity to resist, you know, the prime value. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I think in the, in, you know, in, in the case of uh, 1794, um, it was an all or nothing gamble. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, think that, I don't think terror was a prudent, um, you know, was a prudent policy. It's, it's a policy born out of desperation, I think. And kind of prudence was somehow abandoned. You know, we, you know, mm -hmm. we, you know, we were either going to win or lose. And, you know, but if we lose, then the capacity to resist is, uh, is surrendered. Because I think if, if we have this kind of concept that, you know, We've, we've got to be able to come back and resist again tomorrow, you know, even if we don't win uh, today. Uh, so that, that means that, yeah. that part, of the, part of the prudence of resistance would consist in the capacity to hold back, yeah. Yeah. to be reticent, and to, yes. to yeah, yeah, which yeah. would be yeah. properly Clausewitzian in a sense. Absolutely, yeah, and not, and not to allow for escalation. And I, I think mm -hmm. this is why um, successful acts of resistance have been nonviolent, you know, because they haven't entered into the, a logic of escalation in which you know, they would lose the capacity to act prudently. Mm -hmm. So you know. the French Revolution was an aberration. <laughs> <laughs> I was triggered by what you said. But it, it, does it need? Do, do you need an acceptance of of, of of institutes and states in some sense yeah, that you wouldn't yeah. push it too far? That you wouldn't make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So then yeah. is resistance like this? Maybe a project of emancipation, but the, yeah. the, 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 old, the structure of the house, the structure of the institutes, is more yeah. or less accepted by the. Enemy I, I, I don't think. I mean, I don't think so. I mean, um, the 
you know, a text that comes to mind, I mean, I mentioned it in the talk, is kind of, you know, Mao's work on, protect, on the protracted war of resistance mm -hmm. you know, against the Japanese um, from the, the mid-1930s. And what, what's inter interesting there is the, 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 the concept of time that kind of Mao, you know, tries to, you know, to say is, is proper to kind of resistance. You know, that actually this capacity to resist or the, the war of resistance has to be protracted. It has to, you know, if necessary, it'll have to last for decades. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's not something that can be rushed. But that doesn't mean that you, you adopt a, com you know, a conservative or a, uh, a compromise you know, with institutions that you are resisting. It's just that you don't move to the final kind of battle, which in most cases, I think, you, know, you, you can only lose. Or if you win, you can only win by you know, a complete betrayal. Mm -hmm. Which you know could be, you know, an interpretation of the French Revolution again, um, or certain revolutionary actions. You know, so either you lose, or if you win, you're no longer the same uh, mm -hmm. as you were before. Mm -hmm. Whereas what Mao and other other theorists, I mean, another great example of this is the Green and Common Occupation. I mean, when I was when, you know, when I when I was writing the book, and you know, I watched the Occupy movement, I I understood why the Occupy. I, Occupy movement, you know, appeared and disappeared, you know, like, uh, you know, like the flowers, you know, in, uh, in spring, it was there and then it was gone. But there was a certain frustration comparing that with the Green and Common occupation, because the Green and Common women stayed for 25 years, you know, that, you know, they were evicted thousands, of, literally thousands of times, and they went back, mm -hmm. you know, kind of peacefully, they would return the same day, they'd even be evicted three times in one day. You know, but the Green and Common women had a sense that you know, this struggle could last for decades. You know, the struggle against nuclear weapons being based in American nuclear weapons being based in the United Kingdom. And they weren't going to go until those weapons went. So, I mean, that for me is an example of this capacity to resist working across the long term. You know, they, they did everything to ensure that they continued to resist and to occupy that, those entrances to the, um, the base the, the American air base at Green and Common. That seems to imply a second element, not just um, uh, not just the capacity to hold back and mm. a theory um, yeah. that tells you that you should hold back, that you should not let this uh, evolve into into some kind of uh, large project or terror or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it also seems to imply some form of organization, a command yeah. structure or something mm -hmm. like that, which That's, obviously yeah. was lacking in Occupy, yeah, yeah. and which can have many different forms. But yeah. it seems inevitable it, that you need some kind of authority within yeah. the resistance movement. It's interesting that the, the, the way the Greenham Common women responded to that was to say, instead of command, we need a web. So mm -hmm. they, you know, they, they used the concept of the web before the existence of the web. You know, that... Uh, and they saw their web as being, you know, kind of informal communications among women, uh, you know, in, in various kind of roles and in various institutional roles. They had a meeting once a year in which, you know, their web was you know, invited to come and intensify the occupation. Those, you know, the, the, these these meetings corresponded with the first day, you know, to commemorate the first day of the occupation. Mm -hmm. um, they'd be accompanied by kind of study, the preparation of text and the discussion of texts. All of this was, you know dedicated to this thought that actually the resistance you know, could last for a long time. But it didn't, it didn't need to have a hierarchical command structure. And I think mm -hmm. this is something maybe that also the, the internet now has made possible. Uh, that doesn't have to be kind of hierarchical command structures to, uh, to resistance. But, that, but one could say perhaps that one of the, the strengths of this movement was that it was a one-issue resistance yeah, with yeah, a clear yeah, focus yeah. with one yeah, particular yeah. goal. And that would be a major difference with, yes. for example, the French Revolution, yes. which was about the transformation of, of society, as, society a as a whole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that becomes the, you know, one of the main issues then about you know, the, the difference between revolution and resistance. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Green of Common Women also generalized their struggles. So it, it became you know, the, the struggle against nuclear weapons was you know, considered by them a, a struggle against patriarchal structures kind of more generally. And it was coincided with solidarity for sisters that were you know, in different contexts of depression, uh, of repression in South Africa, in uh, Latin America, in India. You know, so they, they did generalize their, uh, their resistance. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, they, they saw it as being, you know, as being dedicated not to achieving revolutionary transformation, but to you know, 
you know, but to ensuring that that capacity to resist will would always be there, or would be there in the uh, the long term. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, what is the difference with the French Revolution in that respect? Um, now, then you create something that can is will always be there and cannot be ignored, and that some yeah, way yeah. needs to be accepted by the society rather than yeah, changing yeah. society as a whole mm -hmm. because you want to get away with all the old institutions. I think. Yeah. Um, that's the main difference. It's it's not a level of resistance, uh, and yeah. maybe we yeah. have revolution is something different than resistance, not a way of resistance. Yeah. Um, maybe on top there is another level of resistance, uh, yeah. the, the yeah. resistance of individuals. Can we say that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And maybe in the twenty first century this will be yeah. a, rev a century of yeah. resistance by yeah. individuals, not well, only against states but al yeah. also against companies. Companies. Yeah. Apple, yeah. Google. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Apple can be selling my my. They they have like, like this app on my iPhone and it counts every step I take and yes, maybe they yeah. sell it to my health insurance company and then <laughs> it tells me <laughs> now you should pay more because you don't live. Yeah, because he's, yeah. he's dying and he doesn't know it. No, but how do how yeah. how do <laughs> how do you resist like these 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 kinds of new power structures? Oh yeah, I, I think the um, kind of, kind of the, the first question around you know you know the, the resistance revolution is is an interesting one because I think. If, if we think of revolution as in terms of Jacobin revolution, in terms of Leninist revolution, you know, Lenin and what is to be done, it talks about resistance. But he says, you know, resistance are flashes of light in the night. Mm -hmm. you know? And he says there has to be a constant glare of consciousness, revolution of consciousness. You know, you, I mean, with, with the revolution, you can't turn the lights off. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, resistance is just sporadic. You know? yeah. It has to be collected. And, you know. um, Luxembourg, on the other hand, had a, had a notion of revolutionary action, which was very, very different. Which was, you know, actually, you know, these these flashes and these, these flashes of light will actually, you know, spontaneous. uh, spontaneously yeah. then you know, educate you know, the the revolutionary constituencies, and they, you know, rather like you know, the old German social and democratic ideology, you know, they'll gradually create their own society, and the old one will mm -hmm. you know, kind of wither wither away. But the second question, I think, is, uh, is, is, is a difficult one about you know, how then to resist, you know, the, um, you know, the kind of the, the corporate incursions, you know, the, um, you know, the, the surveillance that takes place with any kind of digital um, kind of medium. Now, and I think most of us would be, you know, I, I continue to be very, very kind of surprised, um, you know, shocked even by the extent to which it, it's already you know, engaged. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think we have. Uh, the faintest idea about how how much we're being um, you know, how much we're under surveillance um, you know corporate surveillance and um, uh, kind of political you know, state surveillance question then becomes you know how you know how to resist that I mean one way is to go off grid mm -hmm. um, as you know, an individual yeah yeah mm -hmm. or you know uh, you know uh, as now I mean we, you know we could now, if you wanted to be, you know, not even to be paranoid, but of course, you know, we're, we're all transmitting now, as I said. You know, we could say, well, we want to have a confidential conversation now. Let's all take the batteries out of our phones. Mm -hmm. That yeah. would be noticed yeah. immediately. Yeah, yeah. If we all uh, take absolutely. the batteries yeah, out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, then they would, we would have the police arriving. You know, exactly. you know, <laughs> <laughs> Something would be afoot in this room. You know. um, but, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, one option is to, is to go off grid or to stay off grid. And, and, but that's obviously, you know, that's almost like a Luddite. Know, mm. another kind of uh, response to this. You know, that, um, it's a response that I, I have a lot of, kind of sympathy for. So in, in the book, I, you know, my heroes are Genet and Pasolini, you know, who, mm. who kind of do this. You know, there's like this, this individual going off grid you know, mm. and resisting in, in that way. Um, the other, though, is to you know, start looking at, kind of seriously looking at the uh, availability, you know, one, of encryption and the, the, the use of, uh, of, of encryption. Um, and the other of you know, using alternative forms of uh, of internet, and I, I thought um, with this the the, you know, the Hong Kong kind of strategists or the you know, the Hong Kong uh, resistance you know, really show a, a very interesting example of how mm -hmm. that can be uh, how that can be done. Yeah, that I, is kind I of using. Have, I have two questions there. Yeah. One is about individualism. I think Hong Kong is yeah. not about individuals. No, no. It's about large numbers of people. Yeah. Um, also, when you say, if we all take our batteries out, you use the phrase, if we all. Yeah. And this we all seems to be very important for any form of resistance. Yeah, yeah, Even yeah. If, if you do it on an individual yeah. basis, many people have to do it. Yeah, yeah. They have to do it at the same time. They yeah. have to connect to each other, etc. cetera. Um, and the other question is, is um, about the aim of such a resistance. I mean, if you, if you look at 
the Greenham Common that you were discussing. Yeah. Um, maybe part of the fact, part of the reason why they were tolerated for a very long time mm. was precisely that they had a limited agenda, contrary mm. to Lenin or Robespierre. Yeah, yeah. And so the vast majority of people could think, well, they are against nukes, they're not against mm. us. Yeah, yeah. So we can tolerate them in a corner of society. Even the state could think that way. They mm -hmm. didn't. They did not have. Did not have any further objectives or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. And I think that one of the points that you raise in your book and also in your lecture is about resistance being reactive, not having yeah. a plan, not having an yeah, aim, yeah. etc. Yeah, yeah. So where does the aim come in? I mean, why do people mm. resist yeah. if there is no further aim or at least a concrete, a yeah, concrete yeah, goal? Yeah, yeah. That think, can be reached only yeah. collectively, I, I would suppose. I think we're going right to the, the heart of the difficulties of this, this concept of resistance, you know, and uh, you know, maybe it, its strengths and its, uh, and, and its weaknesses. I think, kind of theoretically, you know, the reason why people resist is, is justice. You know, I, mean, I, I mm -hmm. think it's, uh, you know, that, that there comes a certain point. There's something that I try to discuss you know, when actually you just can't take anymore. You know, that, um, you know, that uh, the, uh, the, the injustice that you suffer or you see others suffering um, you know, becomes intolerable. Um, the secret then, I think, though, is not to, you know, not to react to that, you know, not, not to just react to that immediately. Um, I think this happened with some earlier the resistance, but then to, you know, to modulate that sense of injustice you know, prudently you know, and uh, you know, to uh, try and kind of, you know, you know, respond to an injustice kind of prudently. So I think the, you know, the, you know, the motivation for resistance is going to come from a sense of injustice. I mean, mm -hmm. it's clear in Gandhi in his, uh, in his autobiography, you know, Satyagraha in South Africa. You know, that's, there's, there's just an overwhelming sense of you know, the injustice of the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, of the emerging kind of racist regime in, uh, in South Africa. That just meant it was impossible for, you know, it's impossible to live any longer like that you know, for, for many. Um, but I think if, if you were to go from that sense of injustice to revolutionary strategy straight away, you would then be entering into, you know, that would be imprudent. You know, that, that would be entering into a, um, an escalation. A different which, logic. Yeah, you know, in a different logic. I think the Green and Common women were very, very subtle. I think their objectives were, were far wider, but they, they, they managed to appear and present themselves, you know, uh, to the public, you know, as being one issue. I mean, the state were in no, you know, was in no doubt about, you know, what they were. They actually instituted the final solution of the Green and Common question. That's what they called it. Um, you know, which was to uh, to try and you know find a way. And basically, it involved kind of building a road, mm -hmm. kind of where the occupation was, uh, you know, was, you know, was being held. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, the you know the, the repression of Green and Common was taken very, very seriously, you know, at, at a political level. Um, but in a sense, you know, the, the success of the web and the fact that uh, there could be mass mobilizations at a, you know, with an annual frequency of women um, kind of gave it uh, you know, protection and uh, ensured its survival. Mm -hmm. if, if the point is the question whether people can take any more, yeah. um, whether their sense of injustice is being so violated that they cannot take more and then yeah. start to resist. Yeah, yeah. In your talk you said... Um, it was not in the written version, but you improvised. Argue as yeah. much as you like, but disobey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right now, we are arguing as much as we like, although yeah. there is a time limit. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. But we don't. We're not disobeying. We're not disobeying, disobeying anything. Yeah, we're we're not being on, disobedient yeah. in any yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, Does that yeah. mean that we still can take a lot? Yeah, yeah. Is there yeah. no injustice around us that forces us to be to become resistant? I, I wonder if we're part of a group of humanity that. That can afford the luxury, yeah. You know, um, you know. I, I, I think there, there are many other humans that wouldn't be able to. You know, um, and in a sense, it, it could be that they're, you know, in, in one of the again, one of one of the figures that I that I discuss, one of the events that I discuss in the uh, in the book, which struck me very, you know, very forcibly when when I visited India a couple of years ago, was actually the Maoist um, kind of resistance in uh, in, in India. Um, and you know, in, in this case, you know, here is a, a resistance which is you know, completely disobedient. At as far as the kind of resistance to um, the, the sale of their lands for, uh, 
for mineral kind of mm -hmm. exploitation. Um, but there's no argument, you know, then, and there's no room for argument. I mean, there, there is strict military uh, discipline. So in the end, I think what, what, what we need to find is, a, is it's almost this balance you know, mm -hmm. between you know, uh, a, a defiance mm -hmm. on the one hand and, on the other hand, you know, debate or discussion. If we just have defiance, we give it military form, and we have armed struggle, then you know, there, there's just command. There, yeah. There's no more debate. If we just have debate, then you know, there is, you know, there, there, there's, there's no action. There's no, uh, so somehow there has to be a way of crossing over. The internet has been seen as you know, a key to doing that. Mm -hmm. But I think even it has its you know, vulnerabilities. Have but to be aware of. This, this reflects what you said in your talk about, at one point you said, maybe we have an enemy. That yeah, raises yeah. two questions, yeah. not a, or three. The question yeah, that yeah. you raised, who is the enemy? Yeah. Um, but also the question, who are we? Yes. And yeah, what yeah, about yeah. this maybe? Yeah. Yes. So yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. seems yeah. hesitant somehow. So if, yeah. I, if I push you a little bit on this yeah, point, yeah. do we have an enemy? You're right, sir. You're right, you're right to push me. I mean, I, you know, I mean, maybe I'm just talking about myself. But I, you know, I, 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 I <laughs> do feel, you have an enemy? I, I feel, I, 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 you know, I, I would hate to have an enemy, but I'm pretty sure I, I must have. You know, um, and but you know, the formation of my subjectivity just makes it difficult for me to, you know, you know, to act, to wake up in the morning knowing that I have an enemy. Um, no. But if there's an, you know, if there is an agency that listens to all my conversations and traces my every move, my every thought, my every action, mm. you know, without my consent, then that that must be my enemy. You know? So there yeah. is an enemy. Yeah, yeah. So it, it treats me as its enemy. You know that. Uh, and whether that whether I reciprocate that, but I think what you know again, sort of Gandhi is a, is, is is an interesting case in that that you know Gandhi had you know he, he had an enemy. It was the British you know the British colonial state, but you know this this was you know th that did not entail you know violence mm -hmm. you know, against that enemy. He was just very 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 clear what he could expect from the uh, the British state. No, no, the contrast yeah. of Mao and Gandhi also raises yeah. the issue of violence versus non-violence. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to go to uh, to the audience. I'm sure there are many questions among you. Yes, please. Um, you talked earlier about the uh, criminalization of uh, people who keep secrets. Yeah, yeah. Secrets. I mean, conspiracy law is a very, very the use of conspiracy law is, is a very, very old uh, technique. It, it goes back uh, almost a century, you know, to uh, kind of repressing, um, you know, to repressing dissent. I mean, with the with with the Occupy, you know, with the Occupy St. Pauls, I'm not aware that there were kind of there were there were prosecutions under under conspiracy. Um, but I mean, yes, I mean, even even last night there was a uh, you know, November the fifth is a big night in the United Kingdom. Um, you know, we celebrate or we mourn the uh, you know the failure of the attempt to blow up uh, the Houses of Parliament in the seventeenth uh, uh, century, and uh, <laughs> and the um, uh, kind of last night in particular, there was a you know a, a, a call distri distributed by anonymous um, for a you know a mass demonstration, a march on uh, a march march on Parliament. And the police were responding to this to try and you know to try and find out who it was had you know issued the call and who had you know who had debated it and basically you know with a view to pursuing kind of conspiracy uh, the possibility of a conspiracy charge. You know, so at this point we just have to hope that anonymous's encryption was uh, you know, was, was very good. And no doubt it was. But uh, you know it's it's there as a possibility. You know, always. Well, yeah, it's. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think you would be. You would be under suspicion, but you would not be. Uh, you you would not be prosecuted. I could imagine a case under conspiracy law, that you know, if you know, if we all encrypted our phones, you know, this uh, this, this idea. Of, if we all encrypted our phones, the fact that we all did this at the same time, or the fact that we were in the same kind of city with encrypted phones could be used as evidence for our conspiracy. You know, I can imagine the conspiracy law could admit that kind of degree of, uh, of evidence. But the point of conspiracy law is that 
you know, what's so peculiar about it is that the action, the action of occupying is not a crime, but the action of the debating to occupy is a crime, even if you don't do the occupation. You know? and, th and this is, the, uh, this, this is kind of you know, a, a deeply repressive arm of, uh, of the law against civil society. I don't know if you have anything you know, equivalent in the Netherlands. I don't know any of this. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. It would be outrageous, but it happens, you know. Yeah. 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 Yes, please. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that I think that's that, you know, that's uh, that, that's fascinating information. I think that um, it's it's very much uh, uh, kind of perceived as a problem. You know that that encryption is uh, available or anonymity uh, is uh, is available. Yeah, well, the, the question is, I think, mostly um, by who is it perceived uh, problematic, yeah. and who is putting this on the agenda? Because if mm -hmm. I think that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 No. No. It's uh, and and also with the uh, kind of with, you know, with the associated student protests. You know, they're you know they're the the actual response is you know, particularly in Britain, it, it's uh, it, it's pitiless. Um, you know, so you know, in in a sense, the uh, the, the the encryption is an, uh, an an important issue, or perhaps one of the important. Uh, but this issues. this raises maybe one very important question that also I think was a bit ambiguous in your in your talk about yeah. capacity to resistance yeah. but also you mentioned at the end of your talk you spoke about the possibility of decisive repression yeah, yeah, is it yeah, possible yes. for the state to repress the capacity of resistance in a final way to find a mm. final solution mm. in that respect yeah, yeah, or yeah. is the capacity of resistance inherent to humanity somehow so that we can always again outsmart the authorities I mean, I, I, I would be with your second position. I mean, and, and I think I, I take the... But that might I, be wishful I would, thinking. I would, I would take the historic example of National Socialism, though, and say mm. that uh, the fact that resistance um, persisted under National Socialism, it took very, very uh, indirect kind of forms. Uh -huh. But even within, within Germany, you know, um, uh, you know, you know, young men would wear herringbone jackets to look like kind of, you know, British aristocrats as a form of uh, resistance or listening to swing music, you know, the kind of resistance would take all kinds of mm -hmm. strange kind of, um, kind of directions. You know, there'd be all these little flashes of resistance. Um, although I think the Nazi state was, was very careful to make sure that it never became a capacity uh, to, uh, you know, to resist. But I think, yes, I think, I, I, you know, I think humanity is defiant. You know, um, and maybe that's not so, that's not that's not wishful thinking. I, I think uh, so. Somehow the capacity of resistance is inherently there. I, I think resistance. Ontologically, yeah, in a way. Yeah, sure. Yeah, resistance is uh, is there, but the it, it's it's uh, it's preservation you know, in a particular form over time as a capacity. I think is something that has to be uh, that has to be worked on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
that one. I, yeah, of because course. In, in your book you speak about the the no resistance, the manhunt. You tell it. Yeah, Could you yeah, elaborate yeah. on that a little bit more? Because that is yeah. a situation where no resistance is possible yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a kind of a thesis of uh, Gregoire Chamayou, who wrote a very wonderful book a few years back called the you know, the manhunt, the manhunt doctrine. And uh, recently he's written a book on drone warfare which is kind of trying to extend that thesis to the, you know, what, what he understands as the, the, the link between drone warfare and the collection of you know, metadata. Um, so Shamayu's you know, idea in drone warfare is that uh, you know, we, we begin to approach a point of, you know, where, you know, of, of zero resistance mm -hmm. because the information that's collected um, allows for patterns of association, for inferences of, of targets, which with drone, the use of drones can proceed immediately to, to elimination. So he's saying, you know, for, you know, for Shamayu, kind of Clausewitz, I mean, he'd, he'd find my hanging on to Clausewitz, you know, hopeless nostalgia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that uh, in fact, there's no longer a war. You know, we're no longer at war, there's no longer an enemy, you know, there's a hunt. Yes. You know, um, when the Indian government uh, you know, began their systematic repression of the, the Maoist uh, um, movement, they called it Operation Green Hunt. Mm -hmm. And they uh, kind of basically told, you know, the, you know, they didn't use regular police, they, you know, they, you know, they used, you know, you know, the usual suspects. But they told them that they should consider themselves as hunters, you know, of prey, you know, rather than, you know, kind of police officers or, or so. So that, that does seem to be an, you know, an extreme point. And I think Shamayu mm -hmm. is, is willing to kind of occupy that point. I think I'm still trying to say that, you know, that there are still enemies and that there's still a capacity for struggle. Um, you know. And kind of part of that is because the internet is not one thing. Mm -hmm. So it isn't just collecting information. You know, that there's possibility for a struggle within, within it mm. as well. There was a question on the left side, yes. Um, From my perspective, left side. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but, yeah. Um, a lot of us percentages say at least that we uh, engage in more or less positive politics yeah, by, yeah. by going uh, voting and engaging yeah, in yeah. institutional democracy. Yeah, yeah, Would you yeah. say that someone who has voted last year for the government and uh, the same student is going to uh, this demonstration next week to defend his own rights? Would you say that he is contradicting himself? No, no, I mean, I, I think that you know, they're, they're acting prudently. Uh, in a sense, you know, they're you know they're they're, 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 they're acting politically um, as uh, as they should. But I think you you raise a an important question, and it's something that troubles me very much about resistance: is how far it's reactive, you know, how far it's negative. Um, and one of the things I you know I, I don't think I successfully worked through, but is to try and think of what a what an affirmative resistance might be. And it, it's it's to do with that preserving a capacity to resist. You know, so in in one sense, you know, I, you know. I could say, I'm going, you know, if I was a, a Chinese uh, or a Hong Kong citizen, uh, I could say I'm, I'm resisting the Chinese government's, you know, attempt to basically defraud me of, you know, the democratic promises, you know, that were made with the handover of power. Mm -hmm. um, but on the, you know, and that, that you could say is reactive. You know, the, the, the initiative is with the state. You know, they're going to institute the selection, pre-selection of candidates, okay? And, you know, the resistance say no. But on the other hand, um, when, the, you know, when the Chinese students and you know, their allies kind of act in a way that you know, we have created a capacity to resist, which is not going to go away. You know, kind of Hong Kong you know, hasn't, you know, hasn't finished yet. Um, and it's going to be preserved. That seems to me affirmative. You know, because you're resisting in order to create a capacity to resist, which will come back. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe it won't come back until your grandchildren. But uh, you know, you've you know that's been created and it's being then kind of reproduced and uh, and and fostered. But then you know, I don't think that you know the thing about resistance politics as well is that it doesn't it doesn't necessarily exclude you know, other forms of political kind of participation. Yeah. And also, yeah. I think that what you're saying about the capacity to uh, to resist and the reproduction of that capacity yeah. uh, turns out to be a formal category, because you don't know yet when you have the capacity, you yeah. do not yet know what you are going to resist. Yeah. yeah. So it is yeah. like a general capacity yeah. to resist anything that is perceived at some point as the enemy. 
So yeah. apart from the self-reproductive, which is affirmative in a way, yeah. capacity of resistance, yeah. that doesn't seem, it seems a contradiction in terms to say resistance in view of or resistance in order to. Yeah. It's always yeah. preventive or destructive or... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I wonder if it's both, you know, the, the, the sense that it's both there, that there's, uh, you know, that there's, there is, the, you know, when, when resistance, you know, that's not the capacity to resist, but when resistance manifests itself, it's going to be you know, in reaction to something. To something yeah. um, but the fact that it could happen is because there exists the capacity to resist. Sure. There's a very fine example for me, um, a, a very kind of questionable example in many ways, in, in the work of Hannah Arendt in uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, um, where she reports um, uh, Sergeant Anton Schmidt, who was a... Uh, um, a, a, a German sergeant who supplied materials to the, the Polish and Jewish resistance during the, the Second World War. And she says when his name was mentioned during Eichmann's trials, she said, it's as if the sun suddenly came out. And you know, what a pity there weren't more you know, kind of men of resistant conscience than kind of Anton Schmidt. Now, my reading of that is, is that kind of Arendt is completely mistaken. Um, that, in fact, you know, Schmidt could only produce that act of resistance because there was... Polish and Jewish capacity to resist already there, you know, you know, prepared you mm -hmm. know, to, you know, to, to, re, you know, to receive the fuel for, for lorries, to receive the spare parts. You know, that, you, know, you, you can't have an act of resistance without the capacity to resist. Um, but reciprocally, the capacity to resist is enhanced by those acts of resistance. Mm -hmm. you know, so the, the Second World War examples, I think, are really clear illustrations uh, kind of, of that. Of the you know, uh, historic resistances in the Second World War. That's a very clear example. There was a question on this side, and then you, yeah. Um, uh, the, I, it's maybe interesting information for you as well. Um, hmm. The resistance movement of the last seven years in Lebanon is mainly come from the squad movement. Yeah. They already yeah. formed a unity. Yeah. And you can see this come back from here in the 70s and the 80s. Even the name yeah. itself, but it used tanks to hold back the groups of people that were occupying the streets for just five squads. <laughs> and yeah. um, it goes on in the 90s. And it is since the last five years, since they had different laws and the squatting movement, mm. that there's been an increasing decrease on the resistance in the Netherlands because of the unification of people against the government uh, that are unified uh, mm. is dying out. Yeah. And you named um, the fire chat app yeah, in yeah. China for, for people to unite in, underneath each other. Yeah. I don't know if you've got any more examples. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's my main one. <laughs> but thank you for the information. It, it, it's interesting that the, the squatting movements you know, have, have been one of the, you know, for the contemporary resistances, you know, they, you know, they, they have been one of the paradigmatic cases. The one, the movement I know most about is the uh, is, is the Greek squatting movement, and uh, particularly in uh, in Athens, and they've they've, they've been very remarkable um, because um, you know they have a very very powerful presence, and you know the the Exarchia region of of Athens, so it's like an entire you know kind of uh, part of uh, region of central Athens. It really is central Athens. Um, you have to go past kind of police checks basically to to get into that. Um, you know the roads, are, you know, the borders around this area are, are policed. Um, now, as you know, some years ago, you know the you know the anarchists in the uh, in, in the squads were were prepared all the time to escalate the struggle, and they were you know they were actually being destroyed you know by escalating you know a certain kind of violent struggle, and they they had a lot of kind of theoretical debate, which was provoked by a visit of um, the old situationist Van Eigen. Uh, you know, not, not the Boer, of course, who's no longer with us, but uh, kind of Van Eigen, who basically you know, had a meeting in Thessaloniki, uh, 2011, I think, gave them a lesson in Clausewitz, and you know, basically saying, you know, you, you can't escalate or, or you'll lose. And since then, this, this has become their, you know, their, their debated policy, and they, you know, they, they debate it with posters, the wall posters. And the, well, I think this was at the, at the beginning of last year, you know, the Greek state needed to have a, a demonstration in order to show to you know its European allies that uh, you know what, your, what the problems that it was facing and it very provocatively closed down you know the number one and oldest squat Villa Amalia in uh, in Athens expecting 
you know, actually having the police ready, expecting that this would provoke you know, the violent out, you know, outburst you know, for the German public to, uh, to, you know, to, to witness. <laughs> um, and the, the anarchists were absolutely disciplined you know, with, with this new strategy. You know, they, you know, they basically said the important thing is for you know, the, the movement, the squatting movement to continue even if we lose via Villa Amalia. What is Villa Amalia? It's, it's an idea. It's not a place. You know, we're, you know, it'll always be with us. We'll always be in Villa Amalia. And it's very, very beautiful, poetic kind of responses to this. And in the end, the, you know, the, uh, the police had to go and you know, shoot off a Kalashnikov themselves, mm -hmm. pretending to be the anarchists in order to you know, get the desired effect. The it was, uh, you know, they, 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 they faked an assassination attempt on the, uh, on, on, on the prime minister. Um, so you know, it, it's, it's interesting what you say, that the, you know, the, the squats are kind of a neuralgic point. You know, and um, you know, in, in a way, you know, they, you know, they, 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 they represent, you know, if you can see how the squats are reacting, that gives you a, a, kind of a broader idea, particularly in Europe, of how the, uh, the resistance is developing. How the squats are reacting in the Netherlands? I wouldn't know. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I say I only know the, the, the Greek example. Uh, because the, 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 the squatters, if, if I would put it in my own perspective of what yeah. I've seen, They are kind of in town at the moment yeah. because mm -hmm. uh, in, in 2010 they had the squatting law and um, it, it changed a lot for the squatters themselves. Mm. Um, one of the rules that have changed in the Dutch law is that you don't have to be. Um, it used to be that you were, if you were caught in the first 24 hours, you could be persecuted. Yeah. This has been changed to whenever the police comes in. All oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. This is just one example. Yeah. Um, there is uh, loads of discrimination going on. People just leaving a squad, walking to their cars, cars, and um, mm. having just a screwdriver in their car and being arrested for being uh, yeah. for having a weapon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the the amounts of squads are. Uh, increasingly decreasing, like I said, mm -hmm. um, from Amsterdam, where it used to be uh, around uh, 330 squads, in 2010, mm -hmm. there are only 32 left. Yeah, um, yeah. And in, uh, in Nijmegen, for example, there used to be around 50 um, just four years ago, and there are maybe two left, mm -hmm. which of one yeah, will yeah. be demolished, and yeah, the yeah, other yeah. one is under, under surveillance. If mm -hmm. there would be a party with more than 50 people, it would be enough. Uh, to eradicate all yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. And so, like you said, the yeah. hunting down has already begun. Yeah, you know? yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think the state is more powerful than 10 years, 15 years ago? I, th I think it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, th I think I think without that, or or it's more ruthless, than ruthless, than, ruthless than it was 10 or 15 years ago. You know, it. Uh, I have several <laughs> questions. Is your remark directly on this point? Is it related to this? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because in my opinion, some, there, there was something that started with 9 11, that uh, every mm. small act of resistance was labeled as a terrorism. So, yeah. uh, for example, you're squatting, you have a screwdriver, and you're a yeah. terrorist because you have a weapon in your hand. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so, what should be a positive way to react, uh, to create a positive narrative for, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm. for resistance? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, in order uh, to have a population, so there is this beautiful idea that uh, resistance can be a, a way in which uh, the citizens participate in politics. So, yeah. so but you have to be educated uh, citizens to do this. Mm -hmm. So, what, and uh, in this, at the same time, in our days, we see that the access to education is more and more limited. Uh, there are uh, the rise of the taxes uh, to access to university. And uh, in general, the critical thinking in the university finds uh, less and less place. Mm -hmm. so yeah. 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 Fortunately, we have this room. Yeah, maybe the Netherlands are a specific place, but it's not the same in other countries. Oh, no. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's, you know, the, thank you. I mean, the, the, um, you know, you're, you're absolutely right that you're, you're even possessing an encrypted phone. You know, it could, could look as if, you know, you were um, you know, going to you know, engage in... Uh, uh, threatening or, or terroristic behavior. But what, what I think is encouraging is that 
you know, if we look at the, uh, you know, the you know, if we look at uh, Istanbul last year, if we look at Hong Kong uh, this year, uh, is that actually that cons that resistant cons constituency can can produce it can, can appear very very quickly, and you know when you when you have that degree of participation, you know to you know discuss for the state to start talking about terrorism or uh, you know uh, individual acts of terror, it, it makes itself look stupid. I think the Chinese state made it itself you know, look absurd, you know, and uh, it made itself look as if it was had lost touch with reality. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I, I think there is a, you know, a possibility or, or an optimistic picture we could have of uh, of resistance, you know, that as it remains small, and maybe it all comes back to this concept of the capacity to resist, which I keep going on about. You know, but you know, if that if that does start to you know, to be to to exist and to be recognised uh, as existing. Then acts of acts of resistance, individual acts of resistance, can't really then be stigmatized uh, as being uh, as, as being terroristic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I still have five questions, uh, which even if we are quick, um, will take us beyond half past nine, I suppose. So I start with you, but please be brief in your question, and maybe you can be a bit brief in your <laughs> in your answer too. Resist. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I think it, 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 in certain circumstances uh, it would. I mean, for uh, you know, for Lenin and what is to be done, that is the you know the, the main kind of locus of resistance. You know, uh, kind of you know going on strike, you know, withdrawing labour. Yeah. I, yeah. I think so. But depending on what kind of strike, he means a general strike. Yeah. I think. Well, well he he also you know sort of individual you know you know or even factory kind mm. of. Disturbances, I think. He would say, you know, that these are these are, these are trade union consciousness, and mm -hmm. for him, you know, that's not enough. But I think for resistance, yeah, kind of strike would be uh, you know, would, would be a, would, would be a powerful kind of weapon. Okay. Your question, please. <laughs> yes, I'd like to follow up on this uh, issue of uh, who is the enemy. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I was struck by how you put it. Uh, you don't like to wake up in the morning and say, "Think of who your enemies are," but also when yeah. you Thank you. I, I wonder whether the um, you know the the thought of prudence it would be kind of a way of responding to that. You know that actually you know you know once, once recognizing you know that you know the the problem is systemic. Um, you know the the point is you know not to then demonize the enemy or you know but but actually to you know to act kind of prudently in order to you know maintain the capacity to resist. And it, I guess it's in, you know in your terms the reciprocal of that would be. Know, to reduce the levels levels of delusion. We can also go back to the education question kind of earlier on that I didn't. That, 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 that so I, I yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Ezra. Resistance, you're emphasizing that we, we use 
New York phones, and also um, there are student manifestations in, in the week in the Netherlands, yeah. and students are going there by bus or by train. Yeah. Um, but the, this, is, this is the infrastructure of the state. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in which sense can we actually resist the state? Well, I mean, we can resist, resist the content, I mean, they mm. say something more against it, but yeah. we need the infrastructure to manifest our resistance. So yeah, how yeah. do you see the relationship? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, that, that, I think that's an enormous question, which then takes us back also to the you know the, the example of the internet, you know, which is kind of you know public and you know kind of corporate kind of you know, infrastructure, you know, that we uh, that we need to use. I think it depends on kind of just just on how we use it. I mean, I keep coming back to the you know this issue of of prudent, but of prudence. But there's there's a sense in which we could we we can use this infrastructure imprudently. We can use it uh, kind of you know kind of carelessly. In a way that um, kind of makes kind of repression easy, um, but there are other ways in which we can use it kind of more, uh, you know, kind of more, more, more prudently or mm -hmm. more intelligently. But you know, I think the uh, you know the option of uh, you know of my taking the ba you know, the battery out of my telephone and feeling free um, you know, is, is, is isn't a realistic one. You know, so we you know, we have to be on grid, we have to be connected, but just have to be you know, aware of the the risks that we're taking. I think you know, going back to the the other, the other question of the enemy as well. Um, you know, so you know, when you know, when the students travel to the demonstration, you know, how many of them will think that they're taking a risk? I mean, I, I must say, I've always thought when you know, but maybe I'm a particularly timid guy. I've always thought that when I'm when I'm going to a demonstration, I always thought I'm taking a risk. By train in the Netherlands. By train in the Netherlands. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but the train in the UK, you take a risk. You know, if, you're, if you're not going to a demonstration, but yeah. um, but there, you know, there, there is a sense that there, you know, that you know, of 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 risk there, and that sense of risk would then kind of bring vigilance and uh, and and prudence. Yeah. Yeah. Please please speak speak up a little bit. You still need the infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Resistance can only come up once we have roads, and uh, manifestations can actually come together and manifest our resistance. Yeah, yeah. Isn't, isn't, this, isn't there a, a, a certain let's say, tense relationship between needing the state to resist the state? Yeah, yeah. Um, in this very concrete way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I think it comes to, back to the question of revolution as mm -hmm. well, because in uh, you know, one way of looking at that is to say, well, you know, I, you know I've, got, I've got to seize the state then. Um, you know, so there has to be uh, a revolutionary transformation of the state. The other way of, of looking at it is to say, you know, as, as I was trying to look at the, the internet, you know, on the one hand, the internet is, uh, is an instrument of repression. You know, so kind of road, rail, um, surveillance on road and rail. Um, again, maybe that's more of a parochial UK or London problem, you know, where you know, you're filmed 700 times an hour you know, moving around London. But we don't, we don't have identity cards, that's the upside. Um, but the... Um, the, on, on the other hand, they're also part of the capacity to resist. You know, so the fact that there are railways which can you know, transport you know, large you know, kind of populations you know, to, uh, you know, to, to mm -hmm. protest uh, is part of the capacity to resist. And you know, that, the, the right to do that then has to be you know, kind of very, very kind of carefully defended. Okay, thank you. There was one question in the middle here, then you, and then if there's time, your question. Please. <coughs> Yeah, yeah. And then uh, we have Fukuyama's uh, thesis in yeah, yeah. history. And uh, we in Europe and the United States, we all went into a, a kind of uh, a management by the state. Yes, the yeah. politics management by the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And now you're talking about resistance, and all the examples you, uh, uh, most of the examples mm. do not occur in the United States or in Europe. They occur yeah. in uh, the, yeah. the Arab world. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. China, well, so, some are also in uh, Europe, Turkey, in other yeah. areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would like to believe areas where politics is still lived in another way as in Europe and the United States. Mm. So is there, um, um, is there a problem with, would you say, would there be a, a problem with political awareness in the United States and Europe for uh, mm. citizens to uh, really commit to resistance? I think that's a very, uh, I hadn't. I hadn't clearly thought of that, but it's, it's a very interesting question to try and you know, explain kind of what, you know, first of all, if that is the case, you know, because I'm trying now to think, you know, maybe there are kind of levels of resistance even in the United States and in the, the UK, you know, which, uh, you know, 
you know, are, you know, opposed that, uh, that, that sort of liberal governmentality you know, that uh, they're all, we're all used to. And you know, if there aren't, you know, then kind of, you know, why, why is that the case? You know, you know, well, you know, is, is, is that because there is a satisfaction with the, you know, the, you know, with the way that our lives are governed by the, uh, you know, the state? You know, that there is almost a contract you know, with which we, you know, we believe that you know, the state gives us security um, you know, even if it takes away certain of our, of our liberties or our, or our freedoms. Um, I wonder whether that's, you know, the, you know there's, the, there's those kind of calculations kind of, uh, at work. Um, Yes, yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. It's problematic, and yeah. Well, you know, well I think in the, you know, in the U.S. that yeah, they've also been, you know, you know both the uh, you know the the, you know, the black uh, the black resistance movement and the red resistance movement. You know that you know it is it is deeply contested. I mean, maybe you know maybe, maybe Europe is you know the last bastion of uh, you know, non-resistance, but um, um, but but I don't actually think so. I mean, I don't think so. I think it, it takes on different forms. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in Europe there is a capacity to resist. And it's something, I mean, and, and now I'm speculating, but it's also something to do with resistance during the Second World War. You know, that, that there's that historical precedent which, you know, you particularly feel it in France, but also in Italy, you know, in, it, you know, in the UK sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's even a bit overwhelming. And, uh, so there's political memory in a relevant yeah. sense here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think the, you know, the, the governments in Europe know that you know, uh, and will try to mobilize that. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Very briefly, please, because I have two more people. Okay, I mean, uh, that's kind of <laughs> I'm sorry, it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, the the answer, the answer. Yeah, well, maybe we should, we should talk afterwards. But basically, I, I I think there's a fundamental problem with resistance because, in fact, fascism is a resistance movement as well. Yeah. Um, and there's a fundamental problem with thinking about kind of resistance about saying, well. You know why is you know the the capacity to resist in the name of liberty and uh, um, solidarity? You know why is that laudable, and why would you know the the kind of resistance that you know, many kind of fascists think they're they're conducting, you know, somehow reprehensible? You know the the, the great case for me in the book is the uh, <laughs> sorry boss <laughs> the uh, the great the, the the great case you know the look at my book is the uh, um, the you know the the claims to the French resistance. Uh, the heritage of French resistance made in the late 50s in France, both by the ORS, you know, who said that you know, this is the extreme right, saying that we are continuing the tradition of the French resistance, and by the, you know, the Jensen network, you know, that were offering material solidarity with the Algerian revolutionaries. You know, both claimed to be the French resistance. Um, and I think that, that that's a fundamental problem with resistance that I certainly haven't worked through. But, you know, it will become crucial you know, when, when trying to think about you know, resisting, uh, resisting fascism. Mm -hmm. Your question, please. No, no, sorry, sorry, this lady with the white shawl. You're next. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I mean, this, this goes back to an earlier thought about you know whether you know, actually being human is to be defiant or uh, or resistant. But I think with that that notion of the capacity to resist, it, it it's something that becomes more collective, and not structured, you know, it, it, in the sense of a you know of a hierarchical organization. But it, it is almost it's almost like a tradition or a um, a, you know, a latent resistance, you know, in the sense of which. Um, you know, for example, you know, we we're talking about the memory of, of you know of anti-Nazi resistance, for example. You know, that, that that somehow that that sense of resistance, you know, it is part of a European capacity to resist. And that's different from my you know, my, my individual kind of 
you know, capacity to resist. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in a sense, it could enhance that. It could, it could give that more confidence. You know, so, you know, knowing that uh, you know, at, at a certain time, you know, the, you know, the great cultural heroes you know, of our cultures where the resistance will help me, you know, if I'm a, you know, if I'm a kid at school, help me resist the teacher or help me, you know, it'll give me that kind of courage, you know, to, uh, to resist. Um, but, you know, and, you know, naked individual resistance, you know, without this broader capacity to resist, I think is, is very frail and, uh, and, and vulnerable. And I think as you're saying there, you know, it, it can be kind of mortally expensive. Okay, thank you. Now it's your turn. Yes, I am. <laughs> you were just standing in the same line. So. <laughs> It's interesting you, you you use the you know the word win, you know which um, mm -hmm. I mean for me would take us back into a, a, the revolution. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That, that would take us back into you know that you know that in fact you know, you're resisting in order to to win. And for me, kind of Clausewitz again becomes helpful because he says you know, w you know what is the point of this? You know, on the one hand, you know, winning would mean that your capacity to resist is stronger you know, for the next time, and it would mean that the capacity to resist of your opponent. You know, in this case, say the state or the corporation will be weaker the next time, but it won't mean that you know that there is a you know a concrete aim that's been uh, been realised. You know, hopefully it will mean that there's more justice. You know, and, and, and that's also a question to address to that question, problem of, the, of you know is fascism a resistance movement? You know, in you know in in the case of a uh, you know you know of of of, of, of a non-fascist resistance, you know there you know there should be more justice. Um, you know, there should be more liberty and you know quality fraternity, you know, but you know those aren't the I don't think those are the you know you know they're, they're general aims. There may be the realization of certain aims, you know that you know the elected you know, the officials on an electoral slate won't be pre-selected by the state, but that but yeah no I don't, I don't think uh, I mean I think that can happen and you know it obviously did happen, but uh, you know it. It could also, you know, kind of represent a uh, a dangerous escalation. Mm -hmm. So it's calling. It's, it's almost calling for a, you know, resistance is almost like a Machiavellian politics. You know that, that you know, it's kind of very prudent and is always trying to play a long, a long game. You know to ensure that the kind of resistance will continue to, uh, you know, to uh, to exist and and to manifest mm -hmm. itself. This takes us back nicely to the French Revolution. Do you want to have a, a comment on uh, on this point? No, as, as you were just saying, I think. Uh, yeah. If, if you topple too far, then you again, then you raise the guillotine again on the Place de la Révolution. I think yeah, yeah. it's a really difficult uh, balance between resisting and not being holding resistance as a status quo in which you want to purify society again to transform yeah. it entirely, because yeah. that's again starting terror. Yeah. So I think mm -hmm. yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah. That's a really yeah, yeah, delicate yeah. balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. no, I, I recently read some, uh, you know, some some work around the theory of resistance, you know, because again it's beginning to be theorized more and more, in which uh, you know, a writer was calling for constant mm -hmm. resistance, and that I thought was, was was very very dangerous. You know, this this idea that we have this almost metaphysical constant resistance. Yeah. I mean, I, I think at that point we're escalating towards, you know, the uh, you know the guillotine and and, and beyond. You know, yeah. the, the, the thing. So the point is the constant capacity. Yeah. And not the resistance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I think we have to wind up this uh, this session. I'd like to thank you, Howard Cagle, for your talk and for your participation in the discussion. Also, Bart, for your questions and your participation, and all of you for your questions. Thank you um, if I if I'm correct, there is a book table outside. No, I'm not <laughs> because it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> We're very sorry, but uh, online the web is. Uh, you use the web. <laughs> All right. So there's no book table, no signing session. No, okay. But, but uh, please uh, all come have a drink at the Culture Cafe. Uh, I hope uh, Howard will join us. Well. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. Culture Cafe is on the other yeah. side of the road, but you all know the way, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> and that will also be an opportunity to still have a chat and maybe continue on your questions or discussion. So thank you very much. <laughs>